tonight, Jim's uh, presentation is entitled Note to Self, Change Habits for a Change Within. So I'll hand over to you now, Jim. So thank you for being here with us. Well, thank you, Renee, and thank you, John, for the opportunity to share and welcome fellow students. So what about the title? Um, the convention theme was this for this year was Awakening the Heart, Regenerating Change Within. And I thought to myself, well, what's a practical way to start regenerating change within? And that led me to thinking about how much our lives are ruled by habits or at least mine is, um, and how can we expect a change within without changing our habits? Uh, you've all heard the saying, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. So can we expect a change within without changing our habits? So that led to this rather corny title. And in this case, it's a note addressed to the lower self with a small s and myself in particular. Um, I'm sure we all know as theosophists that the speaker is really only giving a talk in order to teach themselves something. And if any of the audience pick up something, well, then it's a bonus. If you want to learn something, try teaching it. So by giving this talk, I'm going against what I consider a cardinal rule, which comes from a little quote from at the feet of the master from the chapter on desirelessness. Have no desire to speak. It is well to speak little. Better still to say nothing unless you are quite sure that what you wish to say is true, kind, and helpful. Well, I doubt if this is any of those, so I've fallen at the first hurdle. Nevertheless, we're all students in the Theosophical Society, so here are my findings so far. So um, the structure of the talk, a few definitions of, of habits ideas from popular psychology, theosophical thoughts, and some conclusions. So first of all, from the Concise Oxford Dictionary, um, habit is a settled tendency or practice. Um, it can also mean mental constitution, um, especially a habit of mind. Um, it can mean a dress of a particular type, for example, a riding habit or a nun's habit, although this is actually from a different root word. Um, it can have an autom it can mean an automatic reaction to a certain situation in psychology. And it can also mean, mean something leading to addiction, for example, a drug addict or something habit forming. Um, so we're not talking about life processes here that de define living organisms. For example, Mrs. Green that we learnt in school biology, movement, respiration, sensitivity, growth, reproduction and nutrition. Of course, these are habits in a way. If we stop breathing, we die. But uh, for the purposes of the talk, we won't label those necessary life processes as its habits. So as, as humans, um, with some level of self-consciousness, we're capable of self-reflection and, and therefore do tend to judge our habit, habits, good and bad, more useful or less useful, important and less important. And I suppose as theosophists, at least, we are encouraged to judge them. Um, at the feet of the master devotes a whole chapter to discrimination. And we could loosely classify them as physical, emotional, or mental actions or reactions, although they often act in combination. So some phrases we use, um, someone has fallen into the bad habit of, for example, contradiction. Someone is a creature of habit, being one whose behavior is guided by one's habits, um, by force of habit or out of habit because it has become one's custom um, to make a habit of, to do regularly, and to get out of the habit of, to cease to do regularly. So those are some of the ways we use the word habit. So a little section from popular psychology. I've picked up one or two ideas fairly randomly from popular psychology to see if there are any 
useful concepts. There are probably thousands of self-help books out there and I haven't read any of them. However, one study by Wendy Wood, Provost Professor of Psychology and Business at the University of Southern California, suggests 43% 40, of what we do every day is performed out of habit. Now, obviously this must vary with country, culture, gender, occupation, etc. But even if it's vaguely right, it suggests we're creatures of habit. And habits are kind of shortcuts. Um, when you think about it, if we are to gain skill in anything, we need a certain level of repetition so that we're not reinventing the wheel for every action we do. Some people use the figure of putting in 10,000 hours to gain a professionally useful skill. For example, an apprenticeship or training in one of the arts or sciences, etc. The more basic processes become habits so that we can devote more of our time to the creative and interesting side of what we do which will not be habitual. If we took meditation as an example, many, find, many people find it useful to settle on a preferred posture, a preferred place, perhaps an initial counting of breaths to get them closer to the state of mind they want to start in. Um, so what are the mechanisms of forming and keeping habits? Well, here's one version of many called, called the habit cycle or loop. It starts with a cue or a reminder, a craving or an urge, a response or a routine, which is the habit itself, and the reward. And that keeps on looping. Habits are automatic, occurring as part of our daily life. If something is a conscious decision to attend to, we're, we're vulnerable because we have a fantastic capacity to rationalize why we shouldn't attend to it. We're very good at that. Habits protect you against thinking. Well, habits are, are triggered by cues or reminders in an, an environment such as time or place. And every habit has a reward. So when the brain starts to anticipate and crave the reward, it makes the behavior automatic. If you do what you did before, you'll get the reward that you got before. Um, it was neuroscientists who brought habits onto psychology's radar since brain scans cast light on mechanisms unfolding in the deepest and darkest recesses of the brain, identifying which parts are act activated as behavior becomes habitual. As we repeat actions, we engage different aspects of our neural system, and you can actually see a habit forming, habit formation taking place in the brain. When you have people in scanners, activation starts in the decision-making area of the brain, the prefrontal, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. And over time, as you repeat a behavior and keep getting that reward, the activation shifts more to the basal ganglia areas, particularly the putinum, because we're no longer thinking actively. Instead, we're responding based on habit. So you can see in that little diagram, the red arrow there, it's moving from the uh, prefrontal cortex to the basal ganglia. Um, a huge part of understanding how to control change or control your habits is diagnosing the cues and most importantly, the reward that the routine delivers to you. The other thing they say is breaking a habit is almost impossible. One of the neural path, once the neural pathways are set with cue, craving, routine and reward, they are there to stay. Rather than thinking in terms of breaking a bad habit, try thinking of changing a habit by finding a new routine that corresponds to the old cue, one that will deliver whatever reward you are getting from it currently. Experiment with different behaviors that bring the same reward. Don't dwell on the negative trait to change, concentrate on the positive trait 
to change to. It could be a bit like grafting on a plant. We haven't destroyed the whole branch, we've grafted a new bit of plant onto an existing part. I'm sure you've all seen grafted fruit trees where a strong rootstock variety has been has had a grafted on fruiting variety, which is not as strong, but has better fruit in order to get the best of both worlds. In this case, we can graft a new response or routine onto an existing cue. Freud said we're all much more resistant to change than we like to believe. You've also the saying, heard the saying, what we resist persists. There's a reason for that out of control dog there. <clears throat> we could start changing a response or routine in small steps. If like me, your willpower is not that good. For example, I find by six o'clock in the evening, I'm ready to slump on the couch and watch the news on TV. And this can lead to watching something on TV later that might be engaging, but not particularly useful. So perhaps by identifying the cue as six o'clock and the reward is catching up on the day's news, I can still slump on the couch, but instead do an hour's reading before catching up on another news bulletin at seven o'clock or perhaps from radio instead. Now, of course, I'm sure all of you are well-trained theosophists with excellent willpower. So changing responses will not be a problem for any of you. The more you experiment, the more you might get to know yourself, which is probably a good thing for anyone, theosophist or not. Say you want to start a daily morning meditation routine. How long might it take to make a habit? Well, depending on who you talk to, it could vary from three days to 66 days or longer, according to some research. So we all have different resistances, it would seem. And of course, some habits are more difficult to pick up than others. You've probably heard about how disciplined and most uh, disciplined, most successful authors are. Many would say just turning up at a certain time and place each day and aiming perhaps for a, typing a certain word count, good or bad quality, is a huge part of writing, or at least getting in, into the habit of writing. Just about every book on meditation will suggest turning up at the same time and place each day goes a long way to embedding it as a habit. Then it might be a matter of deciding to start with a short time and gradually building it up as you feel comfortable. As I said at the beginning, the person writing the talk probably needs to hear it more than the audience, which is you. So how to do it? Well, one way, use habit anchors, and I hadn't heard the word either. And habit anchoring is a practice of choosing a 30 second action that prompts you to start a new daily meditation routine, for example. And it could be, I will count, inhale and exhale breath cycles for 30 seconds before I start meditating. Then you attach this new 30 second action to the habit anchor, an action you already do as part of your existing daily routine. So I will be counting my breaths as soon as I get out of the shower, could be the way you attach it. And research shows that habit anchors can be a powerful way to get new habits to stick. Another thing, use the habit loop formula. Some experts believe that a process called habit loops, which is somewhat related to habit anchoring, are key for developing a new habit or disrupting the old ones. Charles Duhigg, author of The Power of Habit, describes a habit loop as a combination of cue, routine, reward, and craving. To establish a new routine like meditation, you need a cue or something that triggers your behavior, a reward, being the benefits you get from completing, completing your routine and a craving or the urge you feel once your brain starts to associate your cue with an anticipated reward. So for example, if you're trying to make meditation a habit, a habit loop could look like this. 
choose a cue or reminder, such as taking a shower, and a reward, such as feelings of calm and clarity you get when you've finished meditating. Allow yourself to anticipate those pleasant feelings. Eventually, the craving or urge for that reward will make it easier to set aside some time each day for meditation practice. Now, a few the theosophical thoughts on habits. Here's one from At the Feet of the Master in relation to habit, and it comes from the chapter on love. You must be so filled with the intense desire of service that you are ever on the watch to render it to all around you, not to man alone, but even to animals and plants. You must render it in small things every day that the habit may be formed so that you may not miss the rare opportunity when the great thing offers itself to be done. Some quite inspiring words. Now, many of you will have seen C.W. Leadbeater's chart of the planes of existence or something similar. So we're just talking here about habits being from the physical, astral or emotional and the lower mental planes which on this chart is just the seventh, sixth, and lower part of the fifth planes. So to reinforce the idea of bad habits being difficult to change, I wonder if you'll bear with me for a slightly long quote from HBB's Collected Writings. She says, desire is the outcome of separateness, aiming at satisfaction of self in matter. Now the flesh is a thing of habit, it will repeat mechanically a good impulse for a bad one, according to the impression made on it, and it will continue to repeat it. It is thus not the flesh, which is the original tempter, although it repeat automatically motions imparted to it, and so bring back temptations. In nine cases out of ten, it is the lower manas, which by its images leads the flesh into temptations. Then the body automatically sets up repetitions. That is why it is not true that a man steeped in evil can by sudden conversion become as powerful for good as he was before for evil. His vehicle is too defiled and he can at best but neutralize the evil, balancing up the bad karmic causes he has set in motion at any rate for that incarnation. And she uses a, a rather nice little analogy. You cannot take a herring barrel and use it for an attar of roses. That means an essential oil perfume. The wood is too soaked through with the herring drippings. When evil tendencies and impulses have been thoroughly impressed on the physical nature, they cannot at once be reversed. The molecules of the body have been been set in a karmic direction, and though they have sufficient intelligence to discern between things on their own plane, that is to avoid things harmful to themselves, they cannot understand a change of direction, the impulse to which comes from a higher plane. If they are too suddenly and too violently forced into a reverse action, disease, madness, or death will, will result. Okay, it looks pretty gloomy. We're doomed, Captain Munnerin. We're all doomed. And apologies to uh, Dad's army there. It's one of my habitual little phrases. So we've got to be a little bit careful pruning habits the same way we might prune a bonsai. Cutting off too many branches at once can kill the tree. But if we have a plan of the future pattern of growth, we can carefully train the tree into that growth by using weights and trimming a potential branch in the wrong place as soon as we see it to obtain the overall shape we want. You've heard the phrase nipping, nipping things in the bud and we use it to indicate tacking, tackling undesirable things as soon as we see them. Some habits perhaps are not suitable for grafting new ones onto and we might have to try and be a bit more drastic you could imagine a garden with all sorts of plants growing, some planted deliberately and others that are too opportunistic, which we'll call weeds, that would otherwise smother the plants we've grown. 
as we all know, even with a veggie garden, weeding little and often is better than having the occasional blitz. With a blitz, it is often too late to save some of the veggie plants that have become smothered and ripping larger weeds out of the ground disturbs the soil structure more. Worse still, the weeds may have seeded, making future weeds inevitable. Of course, it's even better if you can suppress weeds around plants with organic mulch, which slows down the weeds and lessens the need to disturb the soil structure. So by now, you can see our garden could be a loose analogy to our own state of being, with our collection of plants and weeds being the habits we have either deliberately planted or have inadvertently picked up along the way, and how we tend to them. So changing habits is going to be difficult and dangerous, especially if they're well established. We might have to hope to graft something new onto their base if we can't destroy them. Less established or newer habits, we might be able to nip in the bud or pull out at the roots if we notice them in time. But there is a glimmer of hope from HBB. And here's another little quote from her collected writings. If one spends time and continual attention to the lower wants and regulations, the upper will be neglected surely, and the mind at last be steeped in such lower observances. The higher states must then be thought of and an attempt be made to pin the thoughts there. The very attempt to do this will result in a natural rising of the mind to the point aimed at. And if it be continued, then a mental habit will ensue. So that from stage to stage, the mind rises higher and higher toward that which it has resolved to seek. And further on, she talks about the duties of those applying to be in the esoteric section of the Theosophical Society, which of course will only apply to some summoned to yes, but it's still interesting here. She says, it is but fair to state at once that such duties will never interfere with or nor encroach upon the probationer's family duties. On the other hand, it is certain that every member of the esoteric section will have to give up more than one personal habit, such as practiced in social life, and to adopt some few ascetic rules. And later on, she says, in order also that the student may receive as much benefit as possible, it is absolutely essential that the superficial and inattentive habits of thought engendered by Western civilization shall be given up and the mind concentrated upon the instructions as a whole, as well as every word in them. To this end, students are required to practice the habit of careful and constant concentration of mind upon every duty and act in life they may have to do and not reserve their efforts in that direction for the consideration of these teachings only. So if we had to put a word to that, um, maybe a word could be mindfulness. Um, I like this picture of uh, someone taking three dogs for a walk. Um, and it's more likely the dogs straining on their leads are actually taking the person for a walk. Um, each dog on their own might be controllable, but when they act in combination, they can really get out of hand. Can you see the correspondence with our three lower bodies and the reactions they can set up? Whenever I see a, someone whose dog is taking them for a walk, I think of this. The three dogs in the picture taking the owner for a walk reminds me of the Buddhist parable by Thich Nhat Hanh, and I think I heard it from John first, which I'm sure many of you have heard. There is a story in Zen circles about a man and a horse. The horse is galloping quickly, and it appears that the man on the horse is going somewhere important. Another man standing alongside the road shouts, where are you going? And the first man replies, I don't know, ask the horse. This is also our story. We are riding a horse. We don't know where we're going and we can't stop. The horse is our habit energy pulling us along and we are powerless. We are always running 
and it has become a habit. We struggle all the time, even during our sleep. We are at war with ourselves and we can easily start a war with others. And a little, another little quote from at the feet of the master from the habit on discrimination. Between right and wrong, it should not be difficult to choose. For those who wish to follow the master have already decided to take the right at all costs. But the body and the man are two, and the man's will is not always what the body wishes. When your body wishes something, stop and think whether you really wish it. For you are God, and you will only what God wills. You must dig deep down into yourself to find the God within you and listen to his voice, which is your voice. Do not mistake your bodies for yourself, neither the physical body, nor the astral, nor the mental. Each one of them will pretend to be the self in order to gain what it wants. But you must know them all and know yourself as their master. So again, uh, a certain level of mindfulness seems to be pointed out by this quote. And I'd like to refer to Tim Boyd's talk on the 8th of January last year, and it, Darkness to Light, Sleep to Waking. And Tim quoted the Pavamana mantra, which means purified. From the unreal, lead me to the real. From darkness, lead me to the light. From death, lead me to immortality. And Tim asks, but are we leadable? And he suggests that to be leadable, we need a purity of our nature. And that purity is not just another behavioral trait of people, for example, being vegan or non-smoker and so on. It is, a, it is a process to purify our nature, replacing materials unresponsive to spirit with those that are more so, for example, replacing junk food, food with those less harmful. And similarly with our emotional bodies, replacing lust, etc., or attaching yourself to the material world with higher things and also thoughts. So how do we purify our nature? Well, of course, to do this, we may need to grow into different habits in our actions emotions and thoughts. And he, and he goes on, how often do we expect information to transform when in reality it doesn't? Inspiration is needed to be transformative, not just the emotional cloaking of it in a speech. And Tim asked, how can we practice inspiration? He said enlightenment is unpredictable usually. It's not a formula. It's an accident. And he suggested that spiritual practice can make us accident prone. Don't you love that phrase? So he suggested some things that could help us. Cultivating a sense of inner quiet by, for example, exposing ourselves to nature, by placing ourselves regularly in the presence of people who are inspired, our vibrations can be raised and the practice of gratitude, looking to the past and giving thanks because it affects the present and the future. So to round this off, and I must have get, got through this in a quicker time than I thought I would, nevertheless, a few conclusions. Habits seem to conform to a cycle of cue, craving, response or routine and reward. We can't always root them out entirely, but we can intervene to improve them, change them for a higher purpose. Habits can be reactions from our physical, emotional and mental bodies, but they can act in combination. Remember the three little dogs getting out of hand. We can learn um, to discriminate between more or use, more useful or less useful habits. We can identify where they arise, mindfulness in thought, word and deed. And 
purifying our na nature, as Tim Boyd suggested, cultivating a sense of inner quiet by, for example, exposing ourselves to nature, by placing ourselves regularly in the presence of people who are inspired, and the practice of gratitude. And the idea from HBB of pinning our thoughts on the higher things as much as we can. And this picture of Mercury symbolizes it for me. And somewhere um, at National Office there, there is a, a beautiful picture of something similar, which is um, blue and white, and it, I always remember that. So in summary, it, it seems that the little bits of both popular psychology and theosophical thought that we touched on here can be quite complementary. So can changing our habits lead to a change within? Well, yes, I believe so. And probably it's a necessary part of our life's journey. Thank you, everyone.